You are listening to episode 11 of Cocktails and Chat. Are you a maker running your own handmade business? Do you love it, but sometimes wish you could go out for drinks with colleagues? If so, then you're in the right place. In this podcast, you'll get to meet a maker on each episode over a cocktail or mocktail. You'll hear about the challenges and joys of running your own business, and you'll learn about many different kinds of making. Just attempt your creative muscles. Mostly, you'll learn that you're in great company as a maker, solopreneur. I'm your host, Sarah Jane Slocum. I provide bookkeeping for makers and artisans. In this series, the spotlight's on having fun and getting to know each other. So relax and join us. Hello. Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, and thank you so much for coming thank on tonight. You. Thank you for asking me to join. It's lovely. I like your um, very spangly background. That's gorgeous. Thank you. Yes. Uh, it was actually destined for a, a project which hasn't yet been made. So in the meantime, it serves as a really great backdrop for this thing. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, um, everybody, this is... Teresa Betelly, have I said that right? Nearly, Betelly. Sorry. That's sorry. all right. No one ever gets it right, don't worry. <laughs> uh, Shirley Rainbow, and I absolutely love your, your company name there. Thank you. Teresa is a designer maker based in Nottingham, UK, where she lives with her husband, two children, and a cat called Nancy. Teresa specialized in embroidery at university and learned how to crochet nine years ago. Hardly a day goes by when she doesn't make something or work on a project. She really enjoys textile-based crafts, anything that needs a needle or pointy, stabby tools. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Thank you very much. I have to admit that the pointy, stabby tools are all part of um, stress relief as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I am. Um... I was doing some pyrography recently and I was having quite a foul day up until that point and then it was it, it shifted the bad mood. So yes, this is this is part of why we choose the, the, the crafts that yeah, we do. I think. Definitely, definitely. I have done some um, needle felting in the past and that was quite therapeutic, but I can't make yeah. anything look good. So <laughs> yeah. doing that. I did. A, I was very lucky that I got a book out of the library just before the first lockdown, which was about creating little needle felted characters. And it was a really, really good distraction in the evening because after a, a lovely session of homeschooling to be able to get a needle and just, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure whether what I made was particularly good or anything, but it was quite fun to make it. And it was certainly a stress buster. Yes, absolutely. That's um, that's such an important thing is to enjoy what we do. Definitely, yeah, definitely. So, I have just fixed mine. What are you drinking tonight? I've got a strawberry daiquiri. Um, yeah. It's yeah. I nearly forgot to bring it upstairs. So <laughs> we would have waited. It's <laughs> oh, it's very nice. I must admit. <laughs> Yeah, that's all good recipe. So, what do you do and how did you get started, Teresa? Well, I've always been making and sewing and sketchbooky things and drawing and stuff. As long as I can remember, I've always done stuff like that. And um, after I had my second child and decided I was going to be a stay at home mum, not go back to work, and I just started doing a little bit of making and things again in the evening. And she was very good at napping, so that meant that I had <laughs> plenty of time. And I just started making and getting back into embroidery, which I'd done at university and hadn't really done a lot with it since. And yeah, the, the rest is history. I was reading a magazine that mentioned um, opening shops with folksy, and I thought that sounded like a really nice idea and something to just kind of tinker away with in my free time. And it's kind of gone from there, you know, built it up very, very slowly over like pretty much the last eight years or so. And it started off as being, you know, maybe a couple of hours a week, 
kind of part time and now I do it while the children are at school and try and do craft fairs and things at the weekends when when I can basically. Excellent, excellent. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was so impressed that you've been going for eight years. That makes a lot of sense that you've just made it work into your life yeah. that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at the beginning, it was barely, you know, you couldn't call it a part-time job, certainly, because it was just only a few hours here and there. And I only had a few little bits in the shop and I just, just built it up. I was lucky that I had a couple of things a, a shop got in touch with me and asked me to stock them um, do some sale or return things with them so that was quite nice and just gave me a little confidence boost as I went along and just little bits of experience got picked up along the way so I was I've been I've been very fortunate and it's kind of it's all come a lot through my folksy shop because you know small shops in the UK have heard of it and they will find people through that oh yeah yeah um, so, um, I sadly do not actually ha have intro music. This, it becomes a podcast when we're done. Yeah. And I don't yet have intro music worked out, but, um, if you had intro music, what song would it be? Oh, this is quite a fun question. I had to have a think and I thought one of my favorite bits of music is um, the soundtrack from... Amelie, the, the film that came out, I think probably 2001, very long time ago. And any music from that would probably, that would be a good intro for me. It's lively and cheerful and it's a bit quirky as well. So yeah, I, that's what I thought I'd go with. Sounds good. Yes, I, I must confess I've missed that movie. I will have to look it up. Oh, it's lovely. It's subtitles, but it's one of the most beautiful and joyful films. And if you, if you watch it when you're feeling a bit low, it's oh, it, 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 it really can cheer you up. Excellent. Well, brilliant. So um, that leads nicely on to how did you get started making films? fun, cheerful, happy flowers and, and all of your stuff is just is so joyful. Thank but you. What, and that's great. And and that's why I found you. But um, what made you pick that niche or gravitate into that? one? Um, I kind of started with doing more kind of more serious embroidered pieces. And it was using the felt that I was using for my background for things like that. And I was using the small pieces of felt that were left over from the larger projects. And I started making some little um, fish out of felt with lots of pieces sewn on and sequins and different types of embroidery on the top. And I shared it on Instagram and someone suggested, I, I can't remember who it was, said, oh, you should put lavender in them. They'd be lovely. And I thought, oh, I could, tr I could try that. And they sold so quickly. I was amazed. And it really kind of spurred me on to trying lots of different designs. And I've just, I enjoyed it so much. It felt much more like my style. And I got to work with different colours. I could do little embellished bits, use sequins, use beads, of which I've got thousands stashed away. And yeah, it's, it just turned my business around a bit and kind of yeah it was a really it was a really good little experiment in texture and color and playfulness yeah and it's so important to make things to sell things in your business that you are passionate about because it comes through everywhere it? yes yeah i think it does when you see someone's work and you think that you know you can tell that they've really loved in making it it's it's a really nice thing as a customer to be able to buy into a little bit of that. Absolutely. Oh, so aside from sequins, mm -hmm. what underrated tools are indispensable for your work? This, this, made, this question made me laugh because the tool that I probably, apart from needle and thread and scissors, which goes without saying, the tool I use a lot of is a very thin crochet hook, but using the wrong end of it so I can poke stuffing and things into small spaces. I'll bet, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I can, I can reach it from here. So it's, it's really fine crochet hook and I just use the ends, just prodding bits in. It's the perfect size. So yeah, that is a very underrated tool. 
maybe there's something better out there i don't know but this works for me well if any of our viewers know of something better do drop a comment <laughs> and let us know. <laughs> but i think you found a perfect solution there yeah. personally very and if any of you have any questions for teresa please do yeah. ask as we go. Or, yeah. or me um so we've talked about the embroidery that you do the crochet the some needle felting personally what other kind of making do you do i do do a bit of dressmaking every now and again um i did a course on that years ago when my mum taught me how to make you know simple clothes for myself and always encouraged me to have a go at learning the skills and yeah stuff I've, I've been i took a pair of trousers for my sister today and i'm going to start making a kind of pair of pajama bottoms over the weekend so that's my that's my aim just a simple baggy pair of trousers but it's just nice to kind of do something different and it's because you have to concentrate it's a proper break if you start thinking about other things you're never going to make something right and follow the instructions yeah especially sewing yeah so I um sewing is the one that I I will do. Mm -hmm. Um, although it's very simple stuff, yeah. I am yeah not I, professional or anything. I've made some and, complicated things in the past. I think I've kind of slowed down a bit on what I like to make, and now I'm you know making a pair of elasticated waist trousers is a really it's a really pleasurable thing. So you know you're going to get a lot of use out of them afterwards. Absolutely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And I love that then you have so much more freedom. So this is the thing for sewing for me or, or making in general is yeah. it gives you the freedom to pick exactly what you want. And I forget that when we go through a spell where we're not making things for a while. So my husband uh, refurbished a bench for the garden mm -hmm. uh, last year. And when he went to put it, uh, when it was all done, because it was in such a state and the cast iron sides we got off a free cycle so i'm not complaining at all yeah we, we, but uh and we thoroughly enjoy it but it just did need a lot of um the cast iron sides were completely rusted and the um wooden slats um i can't remember exactly what had gone they were just aged so he, he sanded the whole lot and then revarnished it all and um but then when he when he came to put it all together, he said, so what color do you want me to paint the, the ends? And I said, oh, yeah, we get a choice. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't just, you know, it's not like every other bench in every other park that we, or in every park that we've ever seen and or in a garden center or something, we haven't bought it. We, we get to choose. <laughs> it's, yeah. It makes it so much more fun and yeah and it's yours then no one else has got a bench like that at all no no so yeah um and and the same with and much more so with sewing i think because then you you pick the fabrics and and mm -hmm. if you want a different neckline well you can do that i can't actually i'm not there yet but <laughs> if, whatever exactly i might be able to manage different sleeve lengths <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, necklines aren't my strong point either, I must admit. So just follow the instructions for those bits. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, okay, so about um, making and, and embroidering things, what's a common myth about your field? Um, I think the most common myth about handmade stuff is that it's cheap, because it's not. No. It's it's expensive to buy materials, especially if you want to buy quality materials, which I absolutely do. And it's slow, which means you've spent a lot of time and effort and that, and it takes a lot of skill, which of course takes time to learn those skills. And people seem to think that because it's not being made in a, by a machine or in a factory, that it should be cheap. And that is certainly not the case in my, in my mind. I think that you know, prizing hand making and small studio based businesses is, is, is essential. And it certainly is not cheap. <laughs> no, it's not. And I can tell you that I've run the numbers. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely not cheap. Yeah. Because you're you're not just it, it is the skill. So you know, this is why we buy off of Etsy or folks or, or off of any of you folks who are so talented at it because sure I can make things but they don't look so great <laughs> so they're just fun for me to do whereas if I want to give a gift I want somebody who has skill and has and makes it really nice so there's that 
but when you're doing that, you're not just buying the stuff that's generally priced for hobbyists rather than businesses. Mm -hmm. So you can find some things wholesale, but you can't find many. There are some things you can't. So mm -hmm. you're, you're you're paying much more than factories are paying to begin with. And then you have all the costs of running a business on top. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I think that people who don't run businesses don't, I certainly had no idea how much it costs to run a business before. So. Well, no, no. I, I'm this. There's also lots of different little costs that jump out as as you get bigger and you want to, you know, you want to be more professional and you want to look more professional. And you're like, oh, crikey, these costs are all, you know, they, they do, they start to nibble away. And some sometimes it's not so much nibbling as in great big bites taken out of things. Yeah. So, yeah, it can, yeah, it can be a bit of an eye opener. But I think... A lot of craftspeople, and I know I'm, I include myself in this, we don't value our time enough as well when we're pricing things. And I, I know I certainly fall into that trap quite often because it's, it's scary and it's, you, you have to kind of really think logically. And when it's something that you've made yourself and you really care about it, it's very difficult to be logical about it. Mm. Absolutely. But as we're talking about running our business, have you always wanted to run your own business? Um, kind of, yes. I've always liked the idea of, you know, I, when I was a teenager, I worked in a small delicatessen, which was run by a couple who lived in our town. And I really liked how they could choose what they wanted to stock in their shop, which, which foods they wanted to stock and what what they put on the notice board outside to say was special of the week and they kind of go oh what should we have this week and then they, they put it out and I just really liked that spontaneity and how they could keep it fresh and no one told them how to do it and I, I did admire that and I can enjoy that part of running my own business as well but I have worked for you know big companies and it's you know it's it's handy but running your own business is certainly more fun i think <laughs> yeah that's a really good point i'm just i i was talking with a friend recently about franchises she's bought a franchise and i've been an employee in many franchises and so she was like she, we were talking about various aspects of that and what you've just said reminds me uh, you know we used to get these packs of okay you will put out this promotional material mm -hmm. at this time and you yeah. will set this out and you will do this and you will do that and you will not do this and and yeah i hadn't stepped back and realized the um the joy of the spontaneity of it being my own business yeah yeah i, I had of course realized the joy of the freedom mm. <laughs> Yeah, spontaneity is a really good one. Yeah. yeah. I love that. And then that's the sort of shop where you can go and say, actually, I'd really like this certain thing. Can you get it? Mm. We used to have a great deli here in town where they could try. Oh, that's it's, it's really nice. Yeah, I really enjoyed that job. It was my first it's my first Saturday job. And I remember the, the first pay packet and how exciting it was. And going out to... I think I think I spent it on a rail card or something extremely dull the first week, but then that <laughs> that meant I had freedom to travel, so that was good too. All right, all right, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. but no, it was a really nice job that was, and I, I worked there for quite a few years. And when I went to university, they take took me back at Christmas and that kind of thing. And yeah, they smelled you smelled of smoked bacon and coffee all the time when you worked there because that's two of the things that they sold. <laughs> so you. Yeah, your clothes did catch those um, strong scents quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they would do. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, coming back to your business, though, what do you like re most about running a handmade business? The fact that no day is the same. The fact that I can take my children to school and I can come back and have a cup of tea and I can check emails. I can spend a bit of time on Instagram and chat to some other makers and and then I can do some making and I can listen to my own music or a podcast and things like that. And I, it's, it's, it's up to me how I run my time. And so long as I'm back at school at the end of the day to pick the children up again, and that's, it, it, it works. And I, I do, I do enjoy that. So kind of, yeah, I'm quite good at setting myself a little target and keeping to it. And it's, 
yeah, it's very satisfying. I think I find it all quite satisfying. Even the dull parts, I, I, I get pleasure from ticking that list on my to, my to do list. I get pleasure from that little tick in the box. Yeah, yeah, hmm. you get a sense of accomplishment and satisfaction. Very much so. Yeah, having done the thing, and hopefully it it helps you in some way, even if it wasn't you know utterly fascinating to do. But yes, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, taking it's, taking the pleasure in doing the small things and making sure that you know it's done properly. That's something I I do enjoy. Yeah. Okay. And, and what do you like least? I find when it's quiet, that's what I like least. When there's not much going on, like in those lulls, like after Christmas, when there's you know the busyness of Christmas is over, and you've kind of recovered your breath, you've caught your breath, and you're back up to wanting to but there's nothing going on. There's no fairs are open. There's no kind of targets to work towards. That's what I find yeah. alarming. And I like that time the least, I must admit. Yeah. Not having motivation and things. That's the thing. I don't mind doing the accounts. I don't mind doing all the admin. That's kind of, you know, like I said, it's a necessary evil, but it's when it's done, it's done. But yeah, not having anything to do is a bit, I don't like very much at all. Fair. Do you not find that, um, do you not just set aside certain tasks for sort of the second or third week of January or the other lulls to... Yeah, I've, I've kind of got better at doing that. clear out of something. Yeah, I have got better at kind of realising that those times, are, they can be productive. Um, but I think especially after Christmas when you've had kind of the crazy rush of, you know, the kind of the home part of Christmas build up, the the school part of the Christmas build up and then the business part as well and you're kind of still running at that pace and then all of a sudden you don't have to and it's that kind of weird kind of slow jog to a normal run a normal trot again it's it's quite strange but yeah, yeah. I, have, I have got better at it I must admit and I need to maybe plan ahead a bit more so that I can use that time more wisely rather than binge watching on Netflix perhaps <laughs> <laughs> I don't know after the Christmas rush you do need some time to decompress though <laughs> yeah all right so uh what's one thing you wish you'd known when you started your business Ooh. um I think I wish I'd known more about taking photos and I still think I have an awful lot to learn about taking photos and things and and I do read a lot of different blogs and tips and I've done you know online photography courses and things when I can um yeah that's I think is something that a lot of makers have got to learn quite quickly as to how to take really excellent quality photos and if you've got the money to pay for a photographer I think that is a wise investment but at the moment I don't feel like that is where I am so I'm still there with trying to touch up and edit photos on my own and I mean there's so many apps that do it a lot better now and I think I've got better but I wish I'd known more in the beginning because I think it would have been a good confident thing to have under your belt being able to take those lovely photos that you see. And of course with a product-based business you say that about hiring a photographer but it's mm -hmm. an, an it's a never-ending cycle of getting yeah. more photography because you keep making different things. Yeah yeah. So, um, it's sort of better to learn so that you can do it on the continual if you can yeah yeah definitely getting a tripod was a really good I think that was a good investment and I got a piece of um it's I think it was supposed to be a kitchen cupboard shelf or something but it's it's big and square and white and I can move it around to where the light is and you know can prop things against it and yeah I've got a lot better at kind of making the most of what I've got but yeah there's a few different little bits that really helped and I think getting a tripod so I can take photos because pe make um, people who are buying handmade products love to see people's hands in the photos and of course having a tripod enables you to take nice photos like that so that was a that was a really useful investment and I kind of wish I'd got that a lot sooner than I actually did but hey ho 
We've got there now. <laughs> now you have it. So there you go. Live and learn. Yeah. You. So there's. Um... I remember the first bookkeeping conference that I went to and one of the in a small group. It was online because it was in 2020. Um, there was a small group video chat and one of the guys uh, who's since become a, a fairly good friend of mine said he was so surprised at how friendly everybody was to each other because aren't we each other's competition? Mm -hmm. And one of the um, ladies who's been in business for quite a long time and has quite a practice built up said, there's enough for all of us. Yeah. There's enough to go around for all of yeah. us. Yeah. And I've come into the handmade uh, sector and I've seen sort of both of those views as well and you fall decidedly on the collaboration over competition you've built up an astonishing network of makers yourself what's the biggest benefit of that for you it's like having a a lovely group of friends in your phone it, particularly I'm, I'm thinking of instagram who you can always send a message to and you know i have chats regularly with other makers saying you know how's it going is it quiet oh how was your craft fair what did you think of that craft fair and just being able to ask for you know general advice and to you know cheer each other up and comment when someone's got a lovely new product and share it and say you know this is someone's made this isn't it gorgeous and it's it's so easy to do and it makes the difference to someone else on the other on the other end of the phone when you've when you've done that. And I just yeah, I really enjoy being part of that community and it's very welcoming and there's always someone who can advise you on, you know, if someone's copied your work or if someone needs some help with photography or what's the best kind of um card reader to get for a craft fair. The, the, the help is out there and it's so e eagerly offered to people as well and I think that's it's it's great and like you say we are each other's competition but if we all acted like competitors all the time it would be a very mean and unpleasant way to live your life it would. yeah it would. so you... I, I do I do enjoy that kind of collaborative side of supporting other people and if you know if you're supportive to someone else they might be supportive to you and you never know whether it might result in a sale further down the line which is what we are all wanting eventually <laughs> there's a sale or a connection for even something bigger um wholesale maybe yeah yeah but yeah i love that i love that um yeah and it, it's that thing where if you're if you're missing the um the water cooler chat mm -hmm. and and so on uh, that you might have had if you were ever in regular jobs um then yeah it's it it provides that it, yeah it really does uh, it's one of the one of the interesting things that's come out of the lockdowns and the pandemic um scenario is that makers have had zoom meetings together to talk about stuff when we couldn't do craft fairs because craft fairs are a great way to to catch up with people and find out how how other people are getting on with stuff and just general crafty business chat and then doing it on zoom meetings meant that you could talk to people from all over the country and it was yeah fabulous it was nerve-wracking at first certainly and you think oh god what if no one's going to talk and we're all just oh, it could be awful and then it's absolutely lovely and it's a great way to spend an hour in your morning or afternoon just you know hearing about how other people are doing things even just seeing into other people's studios and going oh i like your curtains <laughs> and things like that it's really nice and i think being part of um, folksy for that and a few other little small business groups has been that's been really beneficial kind of getting involved yeah so you're a folksy seller but you're also a team captain of folksy yeah. to midlands now what made you choose folksy and how's your experience been in, in um in the beginning in the beginning i did choose i did have an etsy shop and i still do have an etsy shop but it doesn't have very much in it 
But I also um, set up with Folksy after reading a magazine article where they talked about their community of sellers and how they were UK based and really inclusive and really pushing forward you know, skills and local people working in their own spaces and kind of showing that off. And I thought that's really, that sounds really lovely. I'd like to be part of that. And so Etsy has got some great points to it. And the fact that everybody's heard of it is, is wonderful. But it's so vast, I felt very tiny. Whereas folks here smaller and more, it felt like more of a community. And when I started to, literally when I started to put things in the shop, I felt like it was, I know I could work the website more easily. It felt more intuitive to me. And I decided to kind of, make that my main shopping point and yes last was it last year or it might yeah i think it was last year when they were asking if people were interested in kind of working in a more local way th with them and i was like oh i'd love to do that and i was i was thrilled when they said yes we'd love to have you so it's been really good fun kind of supporting other makers in the area and getting to know other makers who are in our area and kind of promoting their work and things we've just had the folksy local spring market and that was really nice kind of getting getting together again and showing off other people's work yeah hard sometimes it can be quite intense i felt like i'd had a bit quite a lot of time on social media that week but it paid off i think <laughs> yeah i think we end up doing that as, as business owners we we kind of ebb and flow yes um, yeah definitely we, having to spend a, a great deal of time on social media and then it'll be the next thing and then it'll be the next thing and then you have to catch up your accounts <laughs> yeah then it'll be another bout of social media again and so on and yeah i i feel like that's kind of typical yeah um, yeah you also taken part in many online markets over the last couple of years what would you um tell a maker considering to do a, who is considering doing one of these for the first time? I can speak. <laughs> it's the run up. It's the daiquiri. It's just the daiquiri. <laughs> we'll blame that, sure. <laughs> um, advice for a person doing the first um, online market for the first time is literally don't expect to sell anything, which sounds awful and counterintuitive to what it's meant to be doing, but use it as a networking event. Um, use it to promote yourself any kind of opportunities that the um, organizers of the market are offering you know they they will ask you to submit little videos maybe do a live chat and all those kind of things jump at all of those opportunities ask them for advice if you're nervous about it and you know a bit anxious with how all the kind of website technology and how you set links up and that kind of thing ask them for help and then just see it as a networking opportunity and a promotional opportunity and yeah enjoy but don't expect to sell anything because you might not or you might have a fantastic weekend i think it's very i've done quite a few different markets now and some were amazing like absolutely amazing and others it was just like tumbleweeds and it was but it's very dependent on if the weather's lovely people are going to be sitting in their gardens and mm. having a barbecue and things and if the weather's rubbish they might be on their sofa scrolling while they're watching the telly and it's very very dependent on that kind of thing i i feel like that um i know that other store holders have said the same that you know so certain weekends have been really quiet but yeah, it's it's just an opportunity to get your name out there, show people what you do, how you do it, and your kind of enthusiasm for your product, and just, yeah, let everyone know. And if you can enjoy yourself while you're doing it, if you kind of get past those nerves, then you're onto a winner in any way, because you've learned something, full stop. Absolutely. So, um, and what would you advise them for the first in-person market? Because I expect oh. it's going to be the opposite way around. You're hoping for sunshine instead of rain. Yes, very much so. Um, yeah, it's always nice to get a bit of sunshine so that people are out and about. Um, you have to be. You have to make sure you've got everything with you and be prepared. You've got to have all your packaging stuff, and you've got to know your table layouts. Make sure you've got a cloth to put over your table that is going to be big enough and have 
stuff like sellotape and drawing pins and scissors and stuff behind your desk because you you just need random things a few a few weeks ago when I did my last in-person market I randomly packed a tape measure and I did think when I was unpacking my stall and putting everything up I thought why have I brought a tape measure today and then someone asked me to make a purse for them and she said oh I want it to be this big and how big and I was like I have a tape measure that's why I brought it <laughs> You knew it came to you. So it came, and I did say that to her. I said, I don't know why I brought this today, but I said it was obviously because I knew that someone was going to need something measuring and subconsciously. <laughs> so, yeah, I have a, a box of stuff. I can actually, I can see it right now. And it's got, you know, all my paper bags that I use and it's got clips and, you know, a pen, notebooks, just all those kind of things. And that's my craft fair box. And I'll make sure before a craft fair that it's stocked up and topped up with all the bits that I might need. I'd say practice your stall setup before you do a stall. You know, if you can do it on the kitchen table at home and see what it looks like, then that's a great way so that when you not when you get to the craft fair, you're not kind of in a panic wondering where things are gonna go and how how it's gonna how it's gonna look. And then I'd say the final thing is is have some lights even if it's just a string of fairy lights that you can kind of thread through your stall. And if cause some places that you go to for a craft fair and you think, oh my goodness, it's so gloomy. And you, people, if people can't see your work, they'll kind of just wander past your stall. Whereas if you've got a bright lit up stall, they're going to zoom in on it to kind of see what's going on. I got some little lights that clip I've got a clip at the bottom and then they kind of come out on a kind of bendy neck and I clip them to the top of my stall and they they go through batteries I must admit it's a bit annoying but they are they are a, a lifesaver if you're in a gloomy church hall and there's the, the lighting's miles away so I'd say yeah have lights pack a box full of bits and bobs take water and drinks and snacks as well try not to spend your lovely profits on the lovely cake stall that's three three doors down <laughs> absolutely yeah. but if you do get a receipt yeah yeah definitely keep that receipt because you can use it later yeah anyway um i saw that you've made tutorials for love crafts how did you get into that how did that happen and how has it impacted your business it was it was crazy i had an email for them asking if i would um be interested in doing some tutorials and they'd show me how their um website worked and i'd have some lessons on doing that and if i'd be interested then they'd send they i think they could provide materials if you needed to and that kind of thing and so yeah i said yeah i'll give it a go and i did a I did a few for them and i got to learn how to use this super duper website called prismic which the first time I did it, I was like every single step I had to look at the instructions to make sure I was doing it right. But it was, I wouldn't say necessarily that it's impacted my business in terms of sales, but maybe because they allow links from their website to my website. It's, it's a really good reciprocal link to have online. I've learned quite a lot about making my website accessible and using keywords and how to kind of present stuff has been really useful as well so it's kind of taught me a lot that I've the skills that I can take forward as well as learning how to take photos step by step and show people how to make a little pencil case or a drawstring bag which that one was I think the most popular one was the drawstring bag and I, I use the one that I made all the time that's the best kind where it actually is quite useful but yeah that would be I was actually tempted by the bookmark myself. Uh, I, I use my bookmark too, I must admit. <laughs> uh, then they asked me to do a little Christmas project for them that was for, they wanted to create a festive tablescape. And I made some little embroidery hoops that um, you could use as a place marker and it could be, you know, all wrapped around a napkin. And it had little snowflakes and things on. And that was a really fun project because I got to set up a Christmas table in September or something and get all the decorations out and create my own festive table. That was really good fun. Yeah. Great, great. Um, <clears throat> I'm 
just distracted right now thinking about what my mother-in-law would say about Christmas and decorations <laughs> in September because she's one of these people who goes, oh, you said the C word. I know. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I've been talking about Christmas decorations already over the last couple of weeks. So it's never too early for Christmas. <laughs> yeah, as a maker, you've just got to get ahead. Yeah. It's just such a panicky time, isn't it? You know, it just feels sometimes like it does feel like it's Christmas all year round, though, because you're kind of thinking about Christmas always as soon as it's finished. And I know big business and designing companies work like that as well. But part of me really, really finds it frustrating when it's I'm wearing shorts and T-shirts and sewing Santa Claus. It's, it doesn't feel quite right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um. But thinking about what sells and what doesn't, what has surprised you? What took off unexpectedly? The lavender bags. That was the thing that surprised me. Yeah, that was really... Those are great because it's the sort of thing that you can get and just give as a little random gift when you visit somebody in their house or, or whatever. Yeah, and yeah, you, when you... I just think when I'm... Because when I made the practice ones and I thought, oh, this is quite fun because, you know, you're putting your laundry away and, oh, there's a cute little something on one of your coat hangers and that's it's just a it was just a nice little surprise and kind of made you smile while you're doing a domestic chore which is always a bonus absolutely and the other item that was did really well really quickly was the mini happy flowers that i i made and you bought one didn't you earlier this year yes yes it's so cheerful it sits on my desk, just at the join of the two monitors, it's just the right exact height and, and width, and oh. it just took me up every day. Oh, oh, it's really lovely. Yeah, they, they were such fun to make, and you know, it was my daughter who suggested that I should do some tiny things, because she, she likes really tiny little toys and stuff, and she says, you should make some tiny things, and I'm like, oh, okay, I'll have a think about that. So I made a mini jellyfish key ring that matches the bigger jellyfish. And then I made the mini flowers, which are a smaller version of the tall ones that people have, you can put into a vase and things. But it's, yeah, they're really good fun to make. And I have all the little li line up of little smiley faces on the desk looking at me. <laughs> it's like, that's nice. <laughs> really, you can, you can set them out as you leave at the end of the night and then they can be there to cheer you up first thing in the morning. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, they really do. <laughs> and has anything sat around sadly unloved? Oh, yes. There's a few, there's a box in the cupboard which has got some, some, <laughs> some, some embroidery pieces that maybe weren't as, you know, maybe not as accomplished as I'd like to think that they are, you know. Yeah, just things just didn't work. Maybe the colours weren't right or they don't photograph well. It's it's quite tricky. And I, I was thinking I really should bring them out and look at them again and see whether I can either reuse them, turn them into something completely different, or whether I should just have a sale and just say goodbye to them. <laughs> I haven't decided yet. Their fate is undecided. Well, before you get rid of them one way or another, I... Have you pondered, have you looked at the set of them together and, and pondered what they might have in common to try to inform yeah. you about why maybe they didn't work? Although it could have just been something like the timing or it could have been any number of things. It might not be the products themselves. Yeah, I would, I should, I should get them out because they kind of, they're just lurking in the background and I do think sometimes... You know, maybe there's nothing wrong with them. Maybe it's just that my taste has changed and so I've, I've moved on in style, but they've, they've become rejected somehow. But yeah, it was, they, should, they need to come out and see the light of day again, I think. <laughs> that could be one of your projects for the lols. That's right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, they should, that should be. <laughs> or you could do something, one of your hobbies or something. So how do you like to spend your free time? Um, I do try and get away from my desk in my free time, I must admit, and kind of try and see the fresh air. I love going for a walk in the woods and the trees and going for bike rides with my family. And um, we've just started learning how to do paddle boarding, which has been great fun. And I've not fallen in yet, so. Well done. <laughs> I know. It's only a matter of time. <laughs> 
<laughs> I will be I will be in at some point I'm fairly certain but I've really enjoyed it it's been it's a complete different thing to be doing and I've yeah I've really enjoyed learning so hopefully I'll be able to get out and do a lot of that for the rest of the summer so you're in Nottingham so is there a convenient lake or something for you to be transporting? yeah there's well there's the river which is one option but I think I need to be a bit more experienced before I get on a fast flowing river with other boats and things um but there's there's a really nice lake that's just outside of Nottingham which we've been going to that's very quiet and peaceful and has a cafe as well so perfect oh well all the important things <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah that's yeah spending time with the kids and doing fun things like that's really really nice I think I would like giving paddle boarding a go or kayaking happy and I have a occasionally toyed with the idea of getting an inflatable kayak because we have nowhere to keep a yeah. regular it. Yeah. Um, yeah, we can. Give oh, it. he has suggested sticking it in the rafters in the attic. Mm. <laughs> Give it a go. It's great fun. I mean, you can do places, so there's places that will just like rent them out for a couple of hours and things. So you can try it. And if it's not for you, you don't have all the stuff at home as well, which is, yeah. There's always some, you always got to find a space for something new. And a kayak is not a small thing to tuck away, is it? No, not even when it's a, an inflatable one, I imagine. It's still going to be sizable. So, but yeah, yeah, being out on um, the water is great fun, I must admit. I, I would recommend giving it a go. I will have to do a, a proper Google and see what's around here for that, where I can rent it. Yeah, food. yeah. Have you ever had a time when something didn't go to plan and at first seemed terrible, but in the end worked out much better than the plan had been? So personal, professional, whatever. Ooh. Um, probably just setting up for business. It felt like craziness at the beginning, even though I really wanted to do it. And yeah, and you think, oh gosh, I've not made a sale for ages, or and you know nobody nobody likes my stuff, and nobody's following me on Instagram, and all those kind of things. And then, and then you actually look back and you think, I was I was learning so much, and so it wasn't as terrible as you think. You, but it's so public. I think when you're setting up a business and you're selling your own things, it's a very public thing to do, and you're showing off something that's made, meant a lot to you. Mm -hmm. and yes if you don't get anything more than a raving review reception about it it feels quite like it can be quite a knock to your confidence and things but when I look back and I think that's it's a ridiculous attitude to have but it's yeah I think that was I think that's how I'd answer that question is that yeah just setting out and thinking what am I doing why am I doing this I'm so scared but then it's okay yes this is um I've been going live weekly in my in my Facebook group with trainings um, for nearly a year now, and I, I've done it very purposefully. Even though my group is very very small, <laughs> and I've been like, "Well, this is practice. <laughs> I will improve as time goes on, and by the time I have more people there, I will be better." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, but you absolutely are absolutely right. We do need to. We do need to learn. Yeah. You've got to start where you are with what you have. And yeah. Yeah. Just and go. Learn by doing. Yeah. Yeah. Hard though it might be in the beginning to kind of get that traction and get going. But yeah. You, yeah. It's the putting yourself out there. You've just got to do it and just kind of <gasps> take a deep breath and go. <laughs> it can be so nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. But um, if you could. I have this little fun question for you. Mm -hmm. If you could phone anybody in the world and have an hour conversation, who would you call? That's quite an easy one for me. Okay. I would love to have a chat with Lucy Worsley, who is a historian on the TV. I, ah. I would love to talk to her for a while. <laughs> she's amazing. I think she's amazing. She's so interesting. She's funny and witty, and she explains complicated historical happenings and I think she's fab so I'd love to chat to her so that would be nice 
That's a great one. Yeah, I haven't thought of Lucy, but you're quite right. I love her. It's, mm -hmm. And she's that, that kind of person who you watch her program and then in, by the end of it, in your head, you're friends with her already. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, I just, yeah, I do think she's fantastic. And yeah, I've followed her online and I've, I even went to a lecture that she had in um, Nottingham last October and it was, it was about Jane Austen and the houses that she lived in. It was fascinating. It was such a fascinating evening because I did think beforehand, I thought, oh, I've, I've read your book on Jane Austen. I've read all of Jane Austen's novels. I've read other books about Jane Austen. What, is, what more is there to learn? Oh, there was loads. It was fantastic. It was, yeah, great night out. Brilliant, mm -hmm. brilliant. What in your life brings you the most joy? Oh, my family. Of course, it has to be my family. Yeah. My daughter, she's eight and my son is 10. And then my lovely husband as well. And the cat. She's quite nice too. <laughs> and my... How old Nancy? Nancy is an elderly lady, roughly about 15 years old. So, yeah. And I'd yeah. have to, I have to mention my extended family as well. You know, my brothers and sisters and my mum and my dad. They're all very important too. But yeah, my little household brings me a lot of joy. Yes, I, I think mine would definitely have to be my husband. <laughs> yeah, I feel bad that my husband was at the end of that list, but at least he was before the cat, I mean, I suppose. <laughs> oh. So I always like to ask, because I really don't know, how do you know when a piece is finished? Ooh, sometimes it just, it's finished. You know when you've finished it. And sometimes I fiddle and twiddle and unpick things and do things again and I just have to go no step away stop now it, it must be done so yes sometimes you just know and sometimes you kind of have to tell yourself that's it you, it's done so it's very much dependent on the piece I think yeah yeah it's a it's a tricky one to kind of explain I think it's kind of when you've you know that you've done all of the little the little details and things that's yeah when they're all in the right place that's that's when it's when it's done do you start with an with a vision of what it will look like um that or i have uh, i do a lot of online i'll do my drawings on a procreate on my ipad and i'll draw out what things are going to look like but I leave the colour up to when I'm choosing the felt that I'm going to sew it on. And then I just, I make such a mess. It's terrible. I get all the bits out and I've got a little pot of beads here, which inevitably is going to get knocked over at some point. And I've got ribbons and things spilling out of drawers and I make so much mess. And then when, of course, it all gets sewn into the right place and it gets tidied up again. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's probably not the most, um, streamlined of techniques that I use <laughs> but it works for me and it, I enjoy it and certain col color combinations come to to you know into play when you kind of get something out and you think oh that should go oh but no it definitely goes with that one over there not the thing that you thought it would so yeah it's just playing around constantly and putting things in different places thank you so um what do you have coming up that you're excited about Ooh, it's a bit quiet on the in the future at the moment I must admit I've got any products that you're working on or no I've got a few things that I need to stock up in my shop and there's the possibility that I'm going to be stocking in a gallery in the near future but I'm still sorting that out at the moment more news to come on that soon at some point. And yeah, so I'm just kind of, just kind of making sure that my shop is stocked up. I've ordered a few new bits that I needed to make some new happy flowers. I've run out of the little bobbins. So I've got them on order at the moment. So yeah, I've got a few things that I need to get on with, but yeah, nothing specific, no date set in the diary. And that feels a bit strange, actually. I think the next permanent thing in the diary is not till November, so. Yes, I need to fill it up. Certainly need to fill it up with a few things going on. Well, you'll get there. Yeah. I am, I am grateful that you were quiet enough to come on tonight. So thank <laughs> you. 
Oh, it's been lovely. It's been really interesting to talk to you and, uh, yeah, share a bit yeah. about the behind the scenes and the person behind the little things that you see online. Absolutely, yes. It has been a delight to get to know you. Thank you, Teresa, so much. That's, you're welcome. You're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me. And where is the best place for the audience to find you online? Is it Instagram? Um, Instagram is probably, yeah, the one where you're going to have the most um, content and things. But I have a website, which is shirleyrainbow.co.uk. And there's links to my shop, my blog, and all kinds of social media on there. So if anyone wants a app-free thing to look at, not an Instagram. I'm on Facebook and Twitter and all those kind of things as well. But they do get neglected because I think Instagram is my, my favourite place to to spend time sharing work and things brilliant and if um so for the people watching the video do you, do you want to show any of your work on the oh i could do um i'll share the little happy flower box with there we go oh it's so adorable for the listeners it's about three inches high i think yeah and it is a smiling little daisy type sunflower type, multicolored flower. You just have to go to her website and check it out <laughs> on the shop link up at the top. Thank you. And, and if a smiling little flower on your desk isn't your cup of tea, <laughs> she's got all sorts of other smiling little things. Yeah, there's lots of different... to do. Shirley Rainbow dot co dot UK. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much. And if you are after any more, um, to our listeners, if you are after any more camaraderie, um, please come join my Facebook group, Handmade Business Club UK. Have a fantastic evening. Enjoy the rest of your strawberry daiquiri. <laughs> I will. Thank you. <laughs> and um, that's it. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Cocktails and Chat, the podcast for building community among makers and artisans. For the show notes with all the places to find Teresa, please visit bookkeepingformakers.co.uk slash cc11. If you liked this episode, please leave a rating or review. It really makes a difference. Until next time, happy making and cheers!